So now that we know a rotating object can do work, what does that do for conservation of energy? Well, that's basically going to do one of two things. So one is I can simply have an object here which then rotates. So for example, the Atwood machine that we talked about before. So in that case, we have one mass attached on one side, another mass attached on the other side. This thing then is going to rotate. And as this thing rotates, one mass moves up, the other mass is going to move down. Now, in this case, since this thing is going to be now rotating, which remember back when we talked about pulleys and we talked about tension, we said that we're gonna assume that our pulleys were massless and frictionless, and now we're gonna drop it sometime in the future. Well, this is where we're gonna drop it. So in this case, this thing is now going to have a mass to it. It now has a radius to it, so it has an extent to it, which means this thing is going to have a kinetic energy. So what's going to happen now is if this thing is simply stationary, all that's going to happen then is I'm going to replace that translational kinetic energy with now rotational kinetic energy. So in this case, the only thing that's going to happen in conservation of energy is instead of having the change in translational kinetic energy plus the change in gravitational potential energy or spring potential energy, now we're going to replace that with now rotational kinetic energy. So in that case, our conservation of energy will then simply become the change in rotational kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy is equal to the work done by the non conservative force. So it's basically the only thing that's going to change. So if I simply have something like this, in that case, I would replace that rotational or translational with rotational. Now it's a little more complicated than that because now if I have multiple objects, for example, the Abbo machine, as this object is moving up, this object is moving down, these two still have translational kinetic energy, which means that if I was using conservation of energy, I would have to include the translational energy of this guy and the change of gravitational potential, the translational energy of this guy and the gravitational potential, but this guy, I would have to also include his rotational energy, but since the center of mass in this guy is not moving up or down, he has zero change in gravitational potential energy. Now, we'll do a problem with this soon, so don't get worry about that too much at this stage. So this is case number one. So in case number one, this thing is simply going to stay still, but it's going to rotate. So when I say stay still, I mean no translational properties to it at all. So that's case number one. Case number two is this thing is actually going to be translating and rotating simultaneously. So for example, when you ride a bike or you drive in your car, you do this. So in this case, we're going to have both translation and rotation. So this thing has a translational kinetic energy since the center of mass is doing this, but it also has a rotational kinetic energy since it's rotating about, which means that we have to know exactly what is the total kinetic energy of this object. Now, to do that, we're going to look at what's known as rolling without slipping. So what is rolling without slipping? So rolling without slipping is exactly this scenario. So in this case, the object is rolling, but it's not slipping, meaning that this thing is not doing this. Okay? So that means that the angular velocity at which this thing is rotating at is not independent of the translational velocity of the center of mass. So that's all this means. So it means as this thing is moving, everything is moving together as opposed to doing this as this thing is trying to move along. So that would be rolling with slipping. So we want to know that how, <clears throat> how does the system work? So the first thing we want to know is where is actually the pivot points, or where is the moment of inertia about in this object? So to do that, let's draw this scenario. So let's draw my wheel. So in this case, we have our wheel. So let's consider only the translational part. So here's my translational. So in this case, if I was pulling this thing simply in what? This direction. So in that case, it would have a center mass velocity be equal to the velocity at which I'm carrying it at. This point up here would also have exactly the same velocity, and this point here would have the same velocity as well. Now, let's consider the same wheel, but now let's rotate it. So meaning that I'm going to rotate it, say, in this direction, 
with an angular velocity of omega. But, as we talked about before, if I simply rotate this with a velocity of omega, what has to be true is that this tangential velocity at this point and this tangential velocity at this point must match the center of mass velocity of the entire object itself. So that means then is that what the tangential velocity at this point would point in this direction, but down here the tangential velocity would point now in this direction. So rolling without slipping then is a simply a summation of these two pictures together. So let's add these together. So in this case, I'm going to redraw my picture. So here's my picture. So in this case, I have a V here plus a V here since they point the same direction. This point here then is actually twice the length. So this has twice that velocity. Here I have a velocity to the right. Here I have nothing, so I add those together. I then simply have a velocity to the right. Down here, I now have what, the velocity to the right, but now this velocity is to the left. Superimpose those two on top of each other, they're going to cancel out, which means that at this point there is no tangential velocity. So basically what this tells us then is that the pivot point is actually down here at the bottom. So that means when this thing is actually rolling without slipping like this, as far as the wheel is concerned, it's actually not rotating about the center mass point but it's actually rotating about this bottom point. So the wheel is actually doing this as it rotates about. Which means this point down here touching the ground is actually the location of the pivot point. So this means that what, if I was looking at the kinetic energy or the total kinetic energy of this object as it's rolling without slipping, it is actually only has rotational kinetic energy about this particular pivot point. <coughs> So what this means then is that the total kinetic energy of my wheel is then simply equal to one half the moment of inertia about that bottom pivot point times that angular velocity squared. Now, <clears throat> but what we know is that this pivot point down here is related to the moment of inertia about the center of mass via our parallel axis theorem. So let's apply our parallel axis theorem and see what happens. So, so this says now that the total kinetic energy is equal to one half times the moment of inertia about that bottom point times the angular velocity squared. But according to our parallel axis theorem, this is going to be rewritten then as the moment of inertia about the center of mass plus the mass of the object times the radius of the object squared. Since so again, if I redraw my picture, the distance from this point to this point is simply the radius of the object, all then times the angular velocity squared. So if I rewrote this, this becomes one half moment of inertia about the center of mass times the angular velocity squared, plus then the mass times the radius squared times then the angular velocity squared. Now what I also know, again, is since this thing has a center of mass velocity in this direction, this point down here has the tangential velocity, this one also has the same tangential velocity, equal then to the center of mass velocity, which means that the angular velocity of this point is simply related to the translational velocity via the radius. So here we can rewrite this omega as simply equal to the tangential velocity, or the velocity about the center of mass, divided by the radius of the object. So let's plug that in here. So this becomes one half, moment of inertia about the center of mass times the angular velocity squared, plus the mass times then the radius squared times the center of mass velocity squared all divided by the radius squared, i.e. those radii cancel each other. Oops, I forgot I one half, put that one half back in. Forgot to distribute that. So this then becomes simply one half times the moment of inertia about the center of mass times the angular velocity squared plus one half times the mass times the center of mass velocity squared. So this means that the total kinetic energy that this thing has during its rotating without slipping, i.e. doing simply this, is equivalent then to the rotational kinetic energy about the center of mass, i.e. this, plus the translational kinetic energy of the center of mass, i.e. this. So the total kinetic energy is broken up then into simply the sum of the rotational kinetic energy plus the translational kinetic energy, both about the center of mass. So if we put that together, this means then is that the total kinetic energy of an object rolling without slipping 
is equal to the rotational kinetic energy about the center of mass plus the translational kinetic energy about the center of mass. So in rolling without slipping, what happens then is that the kinetic energy then separates into two pieces. It now becomes the change in rotational kinetic energy plus the change in translational kinetic energy. But again, those two things are not independent because of this. So because of the fact that the angular velocity is related to the velocity of the center of mass, even though this has angular velocity and this has velocity of the center of mass, these two things are not separate. They are exactly related to each other by the radius of the object itself. <clears throat> so, when I put this into conservation of energy, what this says then is that what? Conservation of energy now says the change in total kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy is equal to the work done by the non conservative force. But as long as it's rolling without slipping, this total kinetic energy is now the change in the rotational kinetic energy plus the change in the translational kinetic energy. So this becomes the change in rotational kinetic energy about the center of mass plus the change in translational kinetic energy about the center of mass plus the change in potential energy is all equal to the work done by the non conservative so conservation of energy, again, stays with exactly the same structure, except now it's dependent on what the system is doing. So again, if this thing is simply rotating, I just now have to change that rotational or the translational kinetic energy into rotational kinetic energy. But if it's doing something like this, rotating without slipping, then the kinetic energy now becomes the sum of the rotational kinetic energy and the translational kinetic energy, both about the center of mass. So, next we'll do some examples and see how this actually works.